Welcome to the Anarchism Research Group video series. Today, we speak to Rhiannon Firth about the anarchist utopianism of mutual aid. Don't forget to click subscribe and like and share this video. I'm Rhiannon Firth. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Nottingham. My PhD was on utopian communities um, and I looked at uh, about 10 different intentional communities, which are communities where people decide to live and work together in order to enhance their shared values and often to kind of prefigure uh, their idea of utopia, to sort of live their idea of utopia in the here and now. What utopia really means, it's the good place that is no place. So any imagination or dream of a different world is utopia. Um, and in my work, I argue that just because something might be possible or it might be idealistic doesn't mean it doesn't have something to offer us in terms of guiding us in the way we, we might want to live our lives. A definition of the word utopia, it comes from the novel by Sir Thomas More that was written in 1516 and it's a pun on three Greek words. There's ou, which means no, spelled O-U, um, e, ou, which means good, and topos, which means place. So it's the good place that is no place. People see utopia as meaning the perfect society. So that's a misunderstanding, really, of what utopia means, because even Thomas More's novel itself wasn't a perfect society. Um, it was a good society that was very different to the society that his readers would have lived in. Um, and it allowed them to see what everyday life looked like in a society where people lived by very different conventions to their own society. And by doing that, it's the novel but it had a certain function of holding a mirror up to people's lives and showing how they could be different. So in mainstream society and media and discourse, um, sort of colloquial English, people are used to seeing utopia as meaning this perfect society. And it's often a derogatory term because it's either seen as some kind of sort of hopelessly idealistic daydreaming and whimsy. So, for example, uh, the Conservative Party often accused the Labour Party of utopianism when they talk about various forms of taxation and redistribution. It's a way to kind of dismiss and silence your opponents often in, in um, contemporary political discourse. It's also often seen as the foundations of dangerous totalitarianisms. So Karl Popper accused Marx um, and communism of being authoritarian because they relied on the idea of a vanguard revolution to institute social change. Um, now, Marx also, he didn't agree with the label utopian and he also criticised the idea of utopia, um, which he projected onto a different group of people, um, the utopian socialists, who attempted to institute these perfect societies, um, which in some ways were a lot less hierarchical than a communist revolution. But Marx's criticism was that they just wouldn't work for everyone. They were sort of bourgeois because they weren't inclusive, because um, they were only for a privileged few people that could enjoy them. So what liberals and Marxists both have in common is that they both accuse each other of being utopian um, liberals do it because they see Marxists as being um, totalitarian and relying on this sort of social change that has to happen all at once and be applied to everybody. Marxists argue that liberals and also utopian socialists are utopian because they lack an that they, they lack an ag agent of social change. So they don't have a sort of scientific theory of how social change should happen. But what's interesting is they're both accusing each other of being utopian. Um, but in fact, all political ideologies have their own utopias. All political ideologies have images of a desired future, um, of an ideal life, of what the good life is, um, of what kinds of concepts and practices are good uh, and what are bad. So even conservatives 
um, have an image of a desired society, which would involve sort of deference to authority um, and the kind of perfect patriarchal family. Neoliberals have a kind of utopia of the free market. Um, so really every political ideology has some kind of utopia. Um, and I think that these misunderstandings of utopia where people sort of cross talk and accuse each other of utopia, uh, what they ignore and miss is the idea of anarchist utopias. Anarchist utopias are utopias which don't necessarily see utopia as something that needs to be located in the future. Um, so it's something that can be located in the present and it's something that we can kind of bring into our own lives through our own relationships and ethical practices and so on. And it links to the idea of prefiguration. So anarchists would often seek to prefigure their utopia in the here and now rather than institute it through uh, a kind of vanguardist revolution where it happened all at once or through uh, sort of piecemeal reforms in the kind of li liberal sense. This is one of the things that got me interested in intentional communities because um, what anarchists and the utopian socialists who Marx criticised have in common um, is that Rather than seeing utopia as being located in the future, their means of social change begins in the here and now. So perhaps through creating intentional communities um, where they try to institute their values in the here and now, or perhaps through certain types of ethical relation like mutual aid. So I, I went to a lot of those during my PhD field work, which was loads of fun. Um, I feel like I had a lot more fun doing my PhD than, for example, people that chose to study things that make them angry, like fascism or something like that, although obviously those things are very valuable. So I was interested in particular in how people negotiate difference, so different positions, different beliefs and ideals when they come together and try to live together. So um, I was interested in their decision making uh, and I was interested in the kind of spaces that they created together. I've applied the idea of utopia as a kind of impulse towards radical social change um, to a lot of different things. Um, I became, intentional communities are quite isolated in some ways, not all of them. Uh, a lot of them are rural and they aim for self-management through environmental sustainability, um, perhaps generating their own electricity, dealing with their own sewage waste and so on, um, which is fantastic. It offers quite a kind of coherent um, package in terms of what utopia is. But I think that a lot of other social movements that are more visible, um, perhaps on the international scene, also have their own utopian visions. So, for example, the Occupy movement had forms of decision making uh, and grassroots democracy, which were very different to the kinds of democracy that we're used to. Also, there's there's a link to fictional utopias. So people often define, some people sort of wrongly define utopia as being merely a form of fiction, like a novel. Um, and I think novels are great because they can act as thought experiments that sort of help us think about how we could live our lives differently. And they might help us think about things that we do that we take for granted um, that are actually oppressive and sort of start thinking about ways that we can change that in the here and now in our everyday lives. Obviously, the idea of mutual aid comes from Kropotkin and is about people helping each other without the state in order to prefigure a sort of utopian world beyond the state and against the state, ultimately. I'm sort of very interested in the idea that mutual aid is a utopian ideal and it's an anarchist utopian ideal against the reformist liberal version of social capital, which is the idea that um, 
societies which have a sort of active civil society are more democratic in a very sort of um, liberal conventional sense. Um, people are more likely to go and vote. And that that kind of social capital terminology ultimately leads to the idea that the only value or the only purpose of people helping each other is ultimately to kind of plaster over the gaps where uh, capital uh, and the state fail um, in order to keep capitalism and the state running. Um, so it, it's even in the word social capital. So the state in this sort of social capital discourse or related discourses like the big society is basically seeking to capitalise on all social relations. Um, and I'm interested in looking at how mutual aid can be more radical than that. Um, and the people that were involved in Occupy Sandy were clearly on the same page with that. Uh, who were a social movement that grew out of Occupy Wall Street about a year after Zuccotti Park was evicted um, and Hurricane Sandy hit um, hit the sort of northeast coast of the United States. People who'd been involved in Occupy Sandy and people who sort of joined the movement around un, under that banner kind of organised disaster relief a lot more successfully than any of the official agencies who were supposed to be organising disaster relief, such as uh, FEMA and the Red Cross and so on. Um, and even in conventional terms and in mainstream media, they were they were seen to have uh, put those agencies to shame, really, with the extent to which they were able to quickly step in and help people. The politics of it was swept aside, in a sense. But that's not to say it wasn't a political movement. It was a very political movement. Um, it grew out of Occupy Wall Street, which was a very political movement. Even people who were not explicitly anarchists were very much informed by um, anarchist ideals around um, direct democracy and, and less hierarchical society. After Occupy Sandy, the Department for Homeland Security uh, published this report called The Resilient Social Network, saying that what Occupy Sandy did was great. You know, they they stepped in before anyone else could. And they sort of said that part of the reasons for that, they, they did it in the terms of sort of efficiency. So it's more efficient because they didn't have all this bureaucratic red tape and all the things that we as anarchists um, would already say is advantageous about anarchist organising. You know, it's it is efficient in a lot of ways because it doesn't rely on um, waiting for someone else to tell you what to do. So the idea was that they sort of stepped in to help where other agencies failed, um, but ultimately the state needs to step in to sort things out. It's just a kind of temporary fix. And that idea of the disaster utopia actually goes back to the 1950s um, and quite conservative discourse then, the idea that after a disaster, everyone will roll their sleeves up and help out in the recovery effort. But eventually um, there's going to be this need for the specialised state bureaucracies to step in as the everyday realities of people's differences come into force and everyone starts falling out again. Um, the anarchist perspective on mutual aid is very different. The anarchist perspective is that without the state, people will naturally help each other. And that's not just a temporary thing. So myself and my colleague and comrade John Preston uh, wrote a book called Coronavirus Class and Mutual Aid in the UK. Um, and we look at some of the ways in which mutual aid was very depoliticised in that movement. Um, and part of it comes from purposeful state policy. And we saw this during Occupy Sandy as well. So during Occupy Sandy, it was kind of retrospective recuperation. So when I say recuperation, I mean the idea of taking these radical ideas and discourses and kind of depoliticising them and absorbing them into this kind of mainstream social capital uh, worldview. With Occupy Sandy, the state retrospectively kind of recuperated it into this neoliberal social capital discourse. With um, the COVID-19 groups, it's almost like that had already happened in advance. So, for example, Public Health England um, put out a statement for people that were shielding, saying that they should 
if they had to shield and they needed shopping doing, then they should expect their neighbours and their family and their community to to help them. And there were many uh, government documents that even used the words mutual aid, um, which is odd because it's an anarchist concept. So the, the idea was that people were sort of told to rely on this. Another thing that happened during the sort of COVID-19 wave of mutual aid was a lot of the people who were involved were ex-Labour Party activists who'd been involved in the sort of hugely enthusiastic organising around Corbyn. But there was also an anarchist movement. And um, I'm writing a book at the moment where I sort of I'm going to be comparing the mutual aid that happened during the Occupy movement with the, mu the mutual aid that happened during COVID-19. And certainly during COVID-19 in the UK, there, there was an anarchist element. So people were often shut down because they were accused of being too political. Um, and there was this sort of lack of recognition of the anarchist history of mutual aid. So some of the some of the things that were shut down in groups were people that tried to talk about moving beyond merely just doing people's shopping for them, which is ob obviously helping, but I don't know if it qualifies for the term mutual aid. And a lot of people who are perhaps NGO professionals or council workers try to introduce uh, ideas around safeguarding and accountability and transparency, which sound uncontroversial in some ways. You know, who who doesn't want to be transparent or, you know, who doesn't want to keep people safe? But these these what these in practice involves would be, for example, trying to force people to have um, DBS checks, so criminal record checks, which obviously excludes some people from being allowed to help their neighbours. Um, for example, someone with a criminal record or someone who's an asylum seeker or uh, somebody who, for whatever reason, doesn't have the documents that are required to undergo a DBS check. So in a, in a way, it sort of means that only some people can help while as others are helped. Um, and it undermines the mutuality of mutual aid. To me, the sort of utopianism in mutual aid resides in the fact that it's a kind of ethical relation between people that's more equal um, and relies on kind of gift exchange rather than commodified relations. And I think in a sense that was lost in a lot of sections of the COVID-19 mutual aid movement, but um, not all. What I'm writing about at the moment really is trying to think through ways of defending the radicalism in mutual aid and keeping mutual aid radical.